The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Join me on this episode, this game reaction episode, after Florida defeats UT Martin 45 to nothing, is Will Salmon from The Athletic. Will, we'll get into the game, of course, but uh, it was good to be back in, in the good graces of the Swamp. Uh, it wasn't a sellout, but a good crowd nonetheless uh, to see – to see a two bits tribute uh, and the team playing in front of uh, in front of the home crowd that was uh, that was good to see. There's there's nothing quite like a home game on a Saturday. Yeah, David, I'm glad you mentioned that just because I mean, like, how cool was that to see the Mr. Two Bits performed by his family members, uh, especially his his grandchildren? I thought they did a remarkable job. Completely nailed that rendition too. Okay. If you haven't checked it out, I totally recommend uh, finding it on YouTube or on Twitter and just watching it real quick uh, because they they really nailed it. And that was pretty cool to see. It was pretty special. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, there's a uh, nothing quite like a a, a home game Saturday. As I said, I thought the crowd was okay. You know, for the, for the most part, uh, I'll go back to week one and and kind of looking at the what you know with Tennessee they lost to Georgia State but look at that crowd and and look at that crowd across the country uh Stanford had a home game week one too and I was like oh, it got me really interested in seeing how the crowd would be for Florida like I said not a sellout but for playing a an opponent everybody knew Florida would defeat coming in a pretty good crowd I, I thought yeah man was it hot outside too so like that was also <laughs> a thing right like I was I was there around maybe like four o'clock or so and I was saying to myself like damn man Oof, good thing this game didn't start at three thirty or something like that because it was blistering hot out, man. It was it was rough. Um, so yeah, it was it was a good crowd, I thought at least, uh, considering the game. And honestly, not for nothing, but if I was a UF fan, or you know, just saying this, I don't really blame UF fans who kind of like postponed watching that game to yeah. watch the LSU Texas game. Right. So you know, like that was also part of the deal. I thought, and put everything into context, we consider all that. I felt like it was a pretty decent crowd. I, I really did. It was fun. I thought so too. Uh, shout out to the Harmonic Woods tailgaters. Uh, I, I, I got to give them the, mon the moniker, the uh, official tailgate the, of Gators Breakdown. So <laughs> those guys bring it every time. Well, you have to stop by one day and just uh, check out this crazy tailgate these guys have. So crazy in a good way. Uh, I mean, when I put it. So I think. Uh, I think they announced yesterday CNN came by and CNN's going to come back by the tailgate uh, for Florida, Tennessee. So uh, they're getting noticed everywhere, but uh, it's a, it's a crazy group of people. So the tailgate was good uh, and uh, all, all, all fun was had uh, before kickoff. So we'll get into this game, but before we do remember, you can find Gators breakdown on news jacks.com slash Gators breakdown. You'll find all the Gators breakdown episodes there and catch the podcast on Apple podcast, Google podcast, Spotify, YouTube, some of us, some of you are watching live on YouTube now, so thank you much for that. Um, and using those services, please share, rate, and review the show. And on social media, follow Gators Breakdown on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. Also, every week, a News 4 Jacks exclusive, Talking with Troop. Former Gators tight end Ben Troop joins me once a week this season on News 4 Jacks and gets his thoughts on the Gators like only he can. You know Ben brings it every time that he's on. Catch that every week exclusively on news 4 jackscom slash Gators breakdown so will and this is a game where florida did what they were supposed to do uh, a little bit of a slow start to where uh you know florida only ran 13 plays in the first quarter but it was all said and done you know 543 total yards on 74 plays 7.3 yard average per play uh number of players that caught a pass 11 number of players that had a carry including quarterbacks nine and 28 defenders made tackles versus ut martin so Will, in mentioning that Florida did what they were supposed to do on drives where Felipe Frank started the started the drives, the Gators scored on six out of eight drives, five of those touchdowns. Uh, they were supposed to win in blowout fashion. They did. They were supposed to be able to get you go give touches to to various offensive players. They were able to do that. Supposed to go deep into the depth chart on the defensive side of the ball, and all that led to a forty-five nothing victory. Yeah, they covered the spread, too, so they did that. Yeah, there we right? go. 41 points. So if you had that, you were happy somehow. I think you had to go uh, in a deep research or a deep uh, find to get that one uh, because that's not too common on books. But, hey, um, feel good if you got that. And, yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty much what you described it as. I will say, though, that if you are sort of looking to critique things and analyze things at a higher level, maybe you want to sit this one out just because, like <laughs> – like, look, you know, Florida came into this game wanting to build depth, and they really, by the looks of their play calls and their designs, really tried to work on things that they considered that they needed to sort of 
uh, that the areas that they needed room for improvement, they wanted to kind of correct. And they, I think they used this game as a way to do that. And they tried to build depth as well, rolling some younger guys through very early. We saw guys as early as the second series on defense uh, getting playing time that they probably otherwise wouldn't see. So, yeah, it was, it was a combination of those things. But, again, they, for the most part, you saw pretty much everything that you wanted to see on a positive note if you're a Florida fan. Uh, you could quibble about the run blocking, and I'm sure we will in a bit. And, obviously, the injuries are not something that you want to see. Uh, Kadarius Tony and C.J. Henderson both leaving the game. Uh, beyond that, though, as far as just the execution, it, yeah, it's really hard to say, okay, this was not something that you didn't think it would be. Right, uh, and I think Mullen uh, even mentioned it, you know, post game. I actually going into halftime as well about the uh, some of the efforts. So we'll, we'll get into that too as well. You know, sometimes look, I, I know you've you've had two weeks off of getting ready for this game uh, after a, a big time Miami game. Of course, you know, the, the spotlight not on this game, much like uh, it, it was two weeks ago. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, so that fed into the mind of some players. But uh, all three quarterbacks played, led by Felipe Franks, 25-27, 270 yards, two touchdowns, 15 consecutive pass completions by Franks. And that's the second most in a single game in school history behind Chris Leak's 17. Franks' only complete pass in the first half was that last play on the half in the Hail Mary attempt that went incomplete. Uh, important uh, after the first game where there were no interceptions, Will. Uh, he had time uh, and, and, and and in the right coverage, was able to scan the field, let wide receivers come open, able to hit some passes downfield. Will, he started with passes of five yards, then one, one yard, nine yards, five yards, negative two yards, five yards, eight yards, six yards before he hit the 69-yard pass to Van Jefferson. Offense opened uh, up pretty much after that uh, at the end of the day. With his 270 yards, uh, four of Frank's uh, five career games of 250-plus passing yards have come in Florida's last five games. Uh, they're dating back to last year, of course. Uh, the outlier there was his career-high 284 yards uh, against Vanderbilt last season. Uh, Mullen mentioned it, uh, and we kind of knew going into this game that Felipe Franks and, and the way this UT Martin defense was going to play him. There was going to be a lot of, you know, taking what the defense gives you. And then once they busted that big play, it was kind of the floodgates open after that. Yeah. But isn't that like sort of like what they do every game? As yeah, far as it like really is. Gives you, right. <laughs> I mean, like Felipe Franks' completion percentage is not something that I, I really put too much of a focus on just because, yeah, it's great. It, it's, it's a cool accomplishment that he was above what 90%. I think it was like what 92% David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's awesome that he got that record. Um, but, you know, you say to yourself, okay, like how many of those were uh, behind the line of scrimmage? How, how many of them were short throws? Um, and I'm not trying to take anything away from him. It's just I look for other things when I'm analyzing Felipe Franks, and I'm saying to myself, did he perform well or not? And it's not just complete, completion percentage that I look at. And honestly, it's probably one of the least things that I look at at this point just because there's other things. And within the context of – what his completion percentage means when you factor in that a lot of those throws are short throws and it's made easy and it's uh, taking what the defense gives him, like you said, you got to look for other things as to sort of say to yourself, okay, was this a good game or a bad game for him? And obviously this was a, a pretty good game for him, I thought at least. And a couple of things jumped out to me in particular was just the way that he operated the offense. I thought, you know, a lot of people will kind of, well, not, maybe not a lot of people, but I did see some people like on Twitter just kind of question like maybe why it was taking him so long long to kind of go through a couple of reads or a couple of plays and and pull the trigger on this on decisions i'd argue a little bit with that and say hey he had a lot of good protection and so like the flip side of that is okay are you asking him to maybe force the force mm -hmm. a throw or make a decision too early i mean if you have the time use it i feel like and i thought he did a pretty decent job of that and the other part of it was he wasn't it wasn't as if he was like zeroing in on his targets or you know staring down his receivers that we saw him have a tendency to do a little bit last year of you didn't really see that a whole lot i liked when he uh made one player in particular i think it was like a third and five or a third and eight where he made a, a really good decision to scramble out of the pocket pick mm -hmm. up some yardage with his legs i thought that was the right move i liked a couple of things he did also later in the game where you know we saw him Again, and he did, he did this against Miami as well, where he was rolling out and he's pointing to, to, to Grimes mm -hmm. to uh, kind of directing him and guiding him on, on where to run that route to break open for a catch. 
did that against Miami, did it again against UT Martin. So that's the kind of things that that's kind of little things that I look for um, as far as his pocket presence and his awareness and his decision making uh, when I rate whether or not this was a good performance from him. And again, I, I decided with this being a pretty, a pretty good day for Felipe Franks, especially when you're saying to yourself, OK, this was somebody that was very easy to kind of play a lower level of competition to, um, which we kind of see from other teams around the country sometimes. Yeah, and I think going back to you know some of the play calling and going back to when I kind of you know noted before the sixty over sixty yard pass to, to Van Jefferson when all the passes were below ten yards and we'll get into this the, this kind of topic the next the next topic as well we'll kind of get into this but with Florida struggling to run the ball and, and push a lot of those swings a lot of those screens I think are play calls because of the struggle in the run game so you're gonna have you're gonna have to use you know those screens and swings as an extension of the run game because it it, it really is a struggle there right now yeah and the other part of it too is that florida's receivers are pretty explosive and i think they're one of the best teams in the country uh top 20 for sure in yards after catch so the idea is to get the ball in their hands right that's what we hear every week all the time is to get the ball in their in their hands what's the easiest way to do that well kind of uh, line them up a little bit, swing it out to them in space where they could really make a play on their own. And we see that happen a bunch, whether it's Kadarius Tony or maybe I should say it was Kadarius Tony, um, but it's also you know, Trevon Grimes. It could be Jacob Copeland. Um, and you can go up and down the list of, of guys that are capable of doing that. Freddie Swain is another guy who comes to mind instantly is uh, Kyle Pitts as well. We've seen in the short passing game, mm-hmm. be a factor. Uh, LaMichael Pirine, for that matter, when, when he's not making carries, he's often uh, being deployed in the passing game or even lining up on the outside um, in some packages. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's all part of the design. And what we were saying before is making it easy. I don't mean that as a slight. It's just – uh, they're making they're, it's just like why overload it? Why why complicate the what you're asking your quarterback to do when you could really simplify the process for him and and really take advantage of what he has around him? Absolutely, and and, and Coach, so in mentioning that the the worrisome part of the offense and, and the run game, you know, start with the offensive line a, a little bit. You know, I, I did expect it to kind of pick up where it left off last season, and, and that's not the case so far. Uh, much of the blames going on to the offensive line and tight ends for you know not holding blocks, not getting enough push. Uh, looking at the stat sheet, doesn't tell the entire story. 231 yards on the ground, 6.1 yard average. It looks good on paper, but uh, starting offensive line wasn't great in the first half on defense. Uh, you know, on the defense that was dropping in the coverage a lot. Uh, rush stats through two games last season. Uh, first game of the season uh, last year versus Charleston Southern, Florida averaged 5.3 yards a carry. And then the next week versus Kentucky, 4.4. So far this year, 1.8 versus Miami and 6.1 versus uh, UT Martin. Uh, so, you know, not bad uh, last night. But uh, uh, so that was 4.85 through two games last season, 3.95 so far through two games uh, this season, if you want to say versus similar defenses here. So, and I know the comparison it may not be fair here, but I do think it's worth looking at. And, you know, what wasn't necessarily a great start last season, a little better than this season, but at least there's a, a silver lining that, you know, it could pick up as we progress through the season. Mullen definitely wasn't uh, fine with the effort uh, go in, in the first half and the hope. And the hope there, I think, in the way he voiced his frustration is that he's seen the offensive line play better in practice and that he's disappointed that he's not getting that same effort in the game time because he knows it can be better. Yeah, I think that the comparison you made is pretty fair, actually. I think there's there's never going to be a perfect comparison because the personnel is different, the opponents are different. But as far as comparisons go, I think it's pretty fair. I mean, it's two games against, like you said, um, relatively comparable oppositions mm-hmm. for both games combined on on each season so yeah um i will say that a, a big difference uh aside from the experience or the game experience i should say in the offensive line is the tight end experience i mean yeah. Sante lewis was a pretty solid blocker for the most part um last year and Kyle Pitts right now in the, in the snaps that he has, has has not looked great as far as run, his run blocking ability. The pass catching and, and being a weapon on offense, no doubt, he's 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 pretty good and, and he's special to watch. But uh, the run blocking is something that he still has to work on, clearly. And, and he's a young player, and so you kind of give him the benefit of the doubt right now. And like I said earlier, this was a game where Florida probably entered wanting to work on some, some specific things and some specific players in certain situations and maybe he was uh an example of that and perhaps against a team like kentucky or 
Auburn or whoever else, maybe we see more of somebody like uh, Gamble in those situations uh, as opposed to Pitts. But for right now, um, and just judging it and evaluating it, you saw in those two plays, I will say that the, the first series on offense, it, it was terrific, I thought. I thought mm -hmm. the blocking was great. I, th I remember vividly Heggy making a nice block on a pull. Everything mm -hmm. was in uh, fluid fashion. It, was, it looked sharp. But then that second series rolled around, and there was two plays in particular where it was uh, Michael Pirine and the first-team offensive line rushing for a total of zero yards on two plays against UT Martin. Yeah. That can't happen. I'm sorry that uh, those those that whole sentence cannot be cannot be a true statement going forward because that's that's not something that you want clearly and it was kind of the same issues in both those plays you saw Kyle Pitts uh, not being able to pick up a block uh, on either play and you saw some uh, a little bit of slowness out of the guards when they were pooling on both of those runs as well and sometimes it led to an unnecessary double team where you know you had two guys blocking the same person leaving somebody else unblocked and if the flip side of that is when you add somebody like Pitts not making a block on that play, there's a second level defender, like i.e. like a linebacker, who is then able to kind of step in a little bit more freely and make a play. And that's where we saw on a second down, Michael Piran had the ball nowhere to go because there was a there was a defender right in his face because the, the guy went untouched and he was and he was right there. So yeah, you could say that maybe Piran could could beat somebody one on one and a premier back in the SEC, you'd probably want to see that. Uh, but again, I mean like he actually does break that tackle a little bit, but the problem was is that there was somebody else in his face mm -hmm. right after that. So you're asking a lot out of Michael Piran if, if you're going to continually to depend on him for that. Um, clearly, you need a better performance in that regard from the offensive line, um, especially up the middle and with a tight end as well. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned up the middle because I think that's what they were trying to work on. Because with, with the running backs, we barely saw any test of edges or options toward the outside or anything like that. That you know, that we know is in the playbook. That you in the SEC play, we'll see Franks and, and P. Ryan on that speed option or Franks and, and Malik Davis on that speed option. But I think you could tell you know, you could, you come in this episode talking about things they really wanted to work on. And I really do think it was that power run game, that inside run game, uh, where you want to see that. And uh, so. Uh, yeah, uh, I, if they wanted to, to spread out some more last night and, and run some option or, or test the edges with, with the speed of Davis or Pierce or whoever, I think they could have done that. But I think Mullen really wanted to see what he had here with this with this starting group of offensive linemen. Yeah, I thought that was pretty clear. Uh, so I'm glad you put a kind of a bow on that um, because I think that's pretty accurate and it's a good it's a good statement because we didn't really see them. We saw good, we saw Tony on a couple. Yeah. Of early on but we didn't really see a whole bunch of stuff to the outside and if they wanted to they probably could have racked up a ton of yardage that way um and made it easier for themselves they could have just coasted to a uh, you know a, a blowout win easily and quicker than they than they did anyway but what did they get out of that uh, right. close to zero <laughs> Not <laughs> a whole lot of, out of this but i feel like hey at least you have a little bit of stuff on the board here where you could kind of go into the film and sort of look for things to correct and, and get better on going forward that you otherwise wouldn't have. Absolutely. Um, we definitely saw how deep Florida is at wide receiver and, and those guys hitting big plays. Uh, but the headline here, of course, is the you alluded to it earlier, the injury to Kadarius Toney and Jacob Copeland getting his first extensive action, catching a touchdown pass and even taking a handoff. Uh, going for 15 yards there. Question will be, uh, as it looks like Tony will be out for a little while. Does this offense need that versatile playmaker to make the offense home along? And can Copeland fill in for Tony in that role? And there's a lot of confidence that he can. Yeah, I really don't think they actually need it. I think he was a. I think Kadarius Tony in his, in in of himself was. I think I put him as. I, I did like a top most important like preseason uh, players in the preseason. Mm -hmm. And I had Kadarius Tony in my top 20, but he was, I think, number 19 or 20, just because there's no doubt he's talented and, and he's fun to watch and he is important. But the thing about him is that he was important because there was nobody else quite like him. It wasn't because he was necessarily uh, somebody who was vital to the offense. Uh, you, you would want them to 
sort of make him a little bit more valuable by getting him the ball a little bit more and and seeing what he could do with the ball in his hands on a more frequent basis or a more consistent basis. But since that really was not happening so much, you can't really say that he was all that vital um, in comparison to, to say somebody like a, a Van Jefferson or a, a Hammond even or a Swain. I would even go as far as to say just because they're dependent on they're they're dependent on so much more. Uh, from those guys as they were Kadarius Tony, maybe that would have changed. I don't, I don't know, but yeah. just from last year and early indication so far, um, I, when you look at the bevy of playmakers that this team has, look, you know, they, they could use Grimes in a number of ways, and we saw that last night a little bit that they haven't really used him in. in. They could going forward, mentioned it earlier, but they could use Pitts in, in some different ways, whether that's you know swing passes to him or screens to him. Uh, go up and down the list with. Uh, Lucas Cruz, another guy who's been kind of underutilized, who could, who could see more balls thrown his way if uh, Tony's not there. So it's not necessarily where they need somebody to ultimately step in and fulfill a role for Tony uh, because they, they do have other guys. But at the same time, I think Copeland can be that guy as well who does actually do that. Uh, we saw a lot of good things from him. One play in particular that I liked, but beyond the touchdown, beyond the 15-yard run that he had, where he really showed some some really good speed. There was a there was a pass to him uh, toward the sideline from Felipe Franks. It was a little bit high that he hauled in. Yeah. And so that, that was another play that I thought was just kind of like okay, uh, we we kind of see his hard work paying off in some ways because he's a guy who was limited by injury early on last year. Uh, didn't necessarily get as many reps as other people during practices. So he's a little bit not as far far along as other guys or guys would be in his position. So for him to make some plays and to, to make me say to myself, okay, this guy could do a couple of different things and he looks like he could be dependent on, so that's a lot for, for his capabilities and for what his upside is for sure. Yeah, and if there's a silver lining for this Kadarius Tony injury, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not wishing injury on anybody here, but uh, there, uh, there is – the belief out there from some that Florida might have too many weapons. And then there's a, a chance where you're trying to get everybody the ball. Well, this subtracts one, you know, from, from that group of receivers. And maybe you, you have another receiver who will get more reps and get into more of a groove and with, with the offense, not having to come off the field as much. So I think that might, you know, that, that could play a part to, in this too, is because you'll find a receiver that you want to that now can be on the field more, whether it be Van Jefferson, whether it be Trevon Grimes, whether it be Jacob Copeland as well. Uh, there are or Swain Hammond. I mean, we go down the list, you know, six, seven guys here, but maybe it's one of those guys now who just get more reps instead of Copeland coming up and just taking Tony's reps. Yeah, and the other thing about Tony though, and I know this is only what we going into week three at this point in early September, but uh, Copeland's the, the guy that you're going to need next year, and yeah. so to get additional reps right now, perhaps, and to kind of show you some things. I mean, that, that can only be good things because it does look like he's capable and physically, man, he's strong. He, that kid's like a bull. So he's, he, he looks the type at least. And, and we saw him on, again, I know it's UT Martin, but that touchdown was a one-on-one -on -one where it was just, it was a, a mismatch for that kid who was defending him. There was no chance on that slant. Uh, he's, he's powerful and he has um, really a, a great mix of power and speed that is, really rare to see at that position yeah and talk about that slant good throw by Kyle Trask there too yeah. and it also bouncing back from what uh, sh should have been a first interception <laughs> uh, interception on one of his first throws there uh, but good on him to, to bounce back and get in the end zone uh with uh with Copeland uh there so actually no he come in for Franks on that Copeland drive right so that interception would have been that after the, with that would be interception would have been after the touchdown right I believe so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, you're kind of crossing me up now, but yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember now. So. <laughs> All right, we'll move to uh, the other side of the ball. Well, the biggest takeaway for me on defense and, and holding the Skyhawks to 194 total yards is is getting those freshman cornerbacks in the game and, and getting them in the game early. Uh, Chester Kimbrough showing up and, and making four tackles. Kyrie Elam making a great one on one tackle at a point in the game and also preserving a shutout uh, while playing a pass perfectly in the end zone. With his interception uh, on the play before that, touchdown may have been scored if not for Jadon Hill chasing down UT Martin quarterback John Backus on a 48-yard gain. Uh, one more reason, this is the biggest takeaway, of course, is the injury scare to C.J. Henderson. While it looks to be relatively minor, he may miss some game uh, game time coming up. And, uh, you know, we, we got to see those three cornerbacks step in and play well. Yes, the opponent, uh, not a great barometer here. But while, you know, this Florida pass rush is playing the way they are, uh, these cornerbacks should be able to hold up 
you know, versus most of the schedule, I think. Yeah, here's a takeaway, right? I mean, like last year when Marco Wilson went down with an injury, it was like, well, you know, well, what are they going to do now? And and we kind of saw that it was not ideal. Trey Dean, I, I think he's a great player, but there were times where you know, he kind of um, what was I don't want to say taken advantage of, but he was beaten coverage a couple of times as a as a freshman corner. Will will have will sort of uh, experience. Yeah, he learned learning on the job. Um, and then the other guy, the other replacements just were, whether it was Brian Edwards or Mick Williams, just were not what you were, you were going to get otherwise, obviously. Uh, but the drop off is not as considerable or not as steep as it would, as it was last year. When you think about what, what could happen this year, if CJ Henderson, for example, needed to miss this upcoming game or, or, uh, next couple of games or whatever the case is, um, you look at these, these young guys and you say to yourselves, okay. These are talented players. They're physical. They're fast, and they look ready. They look the part. Um, and we saw that with uh, obviously Elam's interception was uh, textbook and well done. But like you mentioned, the play before that, uh, it was Hill who chased down the, the quarterback on that large on that big 50-yard scramble um, for a big play. And then, I mean, uh, Ch Chester looked great as well. I think that he really set the tone early on for mm -hmm. the freshman corners with his. I think it was his first play. I know it was his first series where. Uh, they had the, the running back takes a carry, uh, changes direction and goes to the opposite end of the field. And it was uh, Chester who kind of chased him down and, and stopped him short of the first down marker. And so, yeah, I mean, like you, you really like what you saw from those guys. And going along that theme, you really like what you saw from Sean Davis as well. Another guy in that secondary who um, is, took his opportunity and, and is sort of running with it, I would say, because he's a guy who's you're able to kind of depend on in a way that maybe you're not able to say as much as the other safeties on this team. Yeah, I can't speak enough, Will, for uh, what I've seen from Sean Davis these first two games. Uh, made his presence felt in the second half of the Miami game. Uh, then gets to start this game as Juwan Taylor is out injured. He may have, it may have started anyway. I, I don't really know just because from what he did in the Miami game. But and the kid's everywhere. He's, he's someone you notice because he's very active. He's around the ball a lot. Even when he's not making the tackle, he's close to it. Uh, led the team with tackles uh, six versus UT Martin. And, and one of those well, it was for a loss as well, so a tackle for a loss. But he's also one player that is kind of living up to you, – you always wonder when you hear about players in, in, in fall camp if they're actually going to be guys who deliver um, in, in real game action. And in a game and a half, I think – I feel pretty comfortable about putting Sean Davis in that category of a, of a name we hear in fall camp, and it actually translates to on the field as well. Well, I think it started a little bit for him late last year where I remember vividly, I think it was South Carolina or Missouri, where he had that, a couple of tackles early on in one of those games where I said to myself, wow, you know, those are some impressive stops one on one that he made. And I know you have a, a family show here, David, but I was I was, I was <laughs> myself, like, oh, crap, every time he makes a tackle, because it's it kind of like elicits that emotion from you as like a traditional safety would. Um, so yeah, I mean, Davis is doing that and he kind of carried that over into the spring where he had a nice spring. And then, like you said, during the fall, during our uh, training camp, he, he had an interception during the scrimmage, uh, that we heard about and in practices, uh, he, he looked the part. He was a guy that teammates spoke very fondly of coaches as well for him. I think a lot of it depends on confidence. I know that's kind of a trite and maybe a little bit cliche, but, uh, he, he really says it himself, and I heard a lot of people tell me this as well who are close to him or who have who even coached him too, is that it really does start with that with him. And we, we see him close – his closing speed is one of the best on the team, I think. Uh, he shows good instincts. He's playing a lot more free. So we see that confidence really paying off for him, and, and it's evident. And then he, he's really living up to – uh, what people thought he would be capable of when I think he signed with Florida as far as his upside goes, a guy from South Florida who, you know, looked looked like he would be a capable defensive back for Florida in the future, but took took a little bit of time. Uh, you mentioned the game against Miami. That game, of course, for Florida was known a little bit for those missed tackles. I looked at the advanced numbers on that. Uh, Taylor was the guy who unfortunately for Florida had the most broken tackles against him. I think the number was five and I think Donovan Steiner had one or two Davis had didn't have any, and that's kind of not that surprising when you think about it. And when you remember how that game looked, he's not somebody that you really hold your breath with when you see him kind of square up one-on-one -on -one against somebody, you kind of think that he's going to come down with that tackle. 
Yeah, that was nothing. You mentioned tackling there. It was something else that was cleaned up this game as well. Uh, and we saw it really impressed with the you know the true freshmen who were out there and also you know, showed their worth uh, in, in their tackling game, making one on one tackles as well. No matter who, I don't care who the opponent, who the opposing defender, or, uh, uh, um, the person on offense is. But uh, anytime you make a one on one tackle, that's uh, pretty important. Sean Davis made uh, one, I know, early on in the game, and then uh, Kyrie Elam as well too. Uh, I know that kind of stick out in my mind. Zachary Carter to Daryl Slayton, uh, the return of him. Good to see him out on the field. David Reese, Jabari Zuniga, all get in there for five sacks. Will, it's crazy. Already 15 sacks on the season for the for the Gators. Uh, they needed five games to reach that total in 2018. Uh, have 15 after uh, 15 for the season after notching six at Mississippi State last year. Florida also has 26 tackles for a loss this season. It needed seven games to reach that total in 2018. At 29 for the season after notching eight at Vanderbilt. So uh, if you want to go by some important statistics for defense and creating havoc, uh, they are well ahead of their pace from last year. Yeah, and just kind of kind of wrap up on the on the DBs real quick. Another thing to, to kind of point out for those young guys, no penalties either. I, yeah. I think that's something that you kind of have to – I know it's not something that you bring up unless they get a penalty a lot of times. <laughs> It's worth pointing out that hey, like you know, you got you saw a lot of young players, and they didn't really make any mistakes. I felt like, and so you could say to yourself, okay, they look good because of the competition, but they didn't play down to the competition, and they didn't make foolish mistakes that you know, inexperienced players you kind of think are, are, are part of the deal with them. You didn't really see that. They, they, so when I say they looked apart, the that's an example of it. And so with, you know, and that kind of extends to the rest of the defense as well, where like you're saying. Pass rush, man, it looks good. Um, early on, it's still it's still really early, and they haven't really seen that much of a fierce test or a great test because Miami's offensive line we know was rather pitiful um, as far as far as being able to put up a, much of a fight against Florida's uh, front seven or, or you know at least their their defensive front and the, and those guys up there with Jabari Zuniga, uh, Grenard, and, and Moon. So that was an unfair fight. And so is this, and Kentucky will present a much more legitimate matchup. But from what we've seen, you can't really criticize too much at all about what that pass rush looks like because that was a significant question for some people with Ja'Kai Polite leaving for the draft. People didn't really know exactly what it would look like or how they would generate pressure. Man, uh, Zuniga looks like he, he's upgraded himself and boosted his own, his own game a little bit. Grenard looks like the guy who everybody wanted him to be when he came from Louisville. And Jeremiah Moon, man, he had a nice little game yesterday, I thought, especially early on. He was in there. He was in the backfield uh, creating some havoc on his own, uh, really going unblocked on a couple of plays just because he's that fast. And when they did try to put somebody on him, he just overpowered them anyway. So he's quietly putting together a nice couple of good games. So I'm curious to see how he builds off of that going into SEC play because – you know, he, he's one of those guys that not only this year, but next year as well, they're going to depend on as far as pass rush goes. Well, I think uh, one thing I noticed Jeremiah Moon doing uh, yesterday, and I love this part about him, probably lets you know how much of a team player he is. Toward the end of the game, when all the young guys are on the field, and, you know, there's, 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 I'm, I'm assuming some, uh, you know, uh, staffers just on, on the sideline holding up the, the you know if it's the third if it's the third down or a big or a big play you know they have I forget what the saying is but there's a board with a you know a saying that they wave up in the air to get the crowd going to, to get the players on the sideline going Jeremiah Moon was the one holding the sign jumping up and and, and you know kind of trying to cheer on uh, his teammates while they're out there you know some guys that don't get a lot of playing time some guys that haven't got a lot of playing time yet that are out there but it's Jeremiah Moon out there jumping up and down and, you know, help, help lead these guys on. So I think it's, you know, that type of camaraderie that we see with this team uh, and, and a player like Jeremiah Moon, who uh, hasn't really necessarily got a whole lot of playing time either up until this year, but uh, I, I guess kind of knows what it is to be in that role. And he's up there, uh, you know, not necessarily something for his, something that he's not, not that he's doing on the field, making plays, but out there showing support for his teammates. No doubt. I missed that, actually. So it's cool that you brought that up. I, I missed that. I'll have to watch that again. And I'm not one for to be all that sappy, uh, but I'm, I'm with you <laughs> on that. And I, and I like the point just because it extended beyond just one guy. It was a bunch of guys who kind of exhibited that sort of behavior 
We saw Felipe Franks get all excited when Kyle Trask mm -hmm. found uh, Copeland for that touchdown. Um, he, he was pumped up for it. And that was a guy he was just in a competition for just last year. And if, you know, Felipe Franks were to struggle mightily or whatever the case will be, um, we all know the conversations that will be had. So that was kind of cool to see him get excited for his team. And you could look at Felipe Franks in a number of ways. And I always say that you have to judge the entire picture if you're, if you're going to uh, try to evaluate anybody from a character standpoint. And he's a guy who I will never say, or I will never critique his ability or his desire to be a good teammate, because that's something that he has shown he is uh, on a consistent basis. And again, he's not the only guy we saw when Copeland did make that catch. There was like a long line of guys ready to congratulate him and who were super psyched up for him because everybody on that team knows that he experienced a couple of injuries. He was a you know highly touted big time recruit, has waited for his opportunity, and it's, it looks like it's finally here and he's delivering. Uh, same deal with Kyrie Elam when he made that interception. A lot, a lot of guys, whether it was David Reese or um, – Marco Wilson or even CJ Henderson came up to him on the sideline. I saw and congratulated him after that interception. So yeah, you go up and down the list of this team and, and you do see a, a, a pretty tight knit group. And we know that from just watching them in practice and seeing how the position groups interact with one another. Um, I mean, guys within their position groups, whether it's the wide receivers together or the cornerbacks working on their craft together, but it's kind of cool when you see that sort of extend a little bit further. And I think that's a credit to, to kind of go big picture on you, I think it's a credit on um, and a credit to sort of like the strength program where we always heard about how they're very team oriented in their drills and in what they're trying to accomplish with some camaraderie and some goals in the weight room and how they work together as teams in competitions and, and, and things along those lines. That's character building. And, and that's what we see. And that's how it helps you out in games like this and where it's a blowout and people are still sort of emotionally invested on the sideline because they care. And that, that matters because if that doesn't happen in this game, it's not going to happen when you're down, you know, 21, 14 with, you know, three minutes left against a, a pretty good team, like a, like a Georgia or an LSU. It's just, it, it doesn't happen like that. So it's, it's cool to see if you're a Florida fan. Yeah. You had, you had players wanting to run onto the field when Copeland scored his touchdown. To get congratulated. Uh, so they had to stay on the sideline, of course, you know, so you don't get penalized, but uh, they wanted to go out there and, and congratulate him. So yeah, that's some, some good stuff to see. Uh, some good stuff to notice in a, in a game that was well out of hand is uh, how, how close these guys are uh, as well. Um, let's, Will, let's get to a couple quick tweets here uh, from, uh, from our listeners here who uh, send in their reaction tweets as well. Let's start with uh, Lord Heller. He said, yes, uh, offensive line is number one concern. Uh, but second for me is it didn't seem like primary wide receivers were getting open. Frank seemed to pull back a lot of passes and forced to check to third or fourth progression, similar to Miami. We kind of hit on that a, a little bit. Part of it was because of what UT Martin was doing on defense and dropping so many guys in coverage. And he'd have to, you know, if, if your number one guy is not there, not open because, look, he's guarded by, or you know, however – UT Martin's playing defense. There's not a big window uh, in there to throw to, especially deep uh, until later in the game. You know, it, it was a – I know fans get tired of hearing it sometimes, but it really was a classic take what the defense gives you until until you can until you can break it open. They were playing a 3-3-5, which is pretty a pretty weird defensive scheme. And, yeah, that's three linemen. So it's like they're dropping all those guys back. And so, yeah, you're going to have plenty of time and you're going to see some – um, deliberation from Felipe Franks, and he was afforded that opportunity, so why not go with it? So yeah, guys weren't open, but a lot of times on, or or at least a few times on certain plays. But yeah, I'm just not really willing to really pin that on the receivers themselves, just because we we know what they're capable of. I mean, we know that Van Jefferson could get in and out of his breaks, and we we know the routes that he's able to run. Same thing with Grimes. Not too many guys college football for that matter can keep up with him um so i'm not really i wouldn't be that worried about it i think what you said david is pretty true i know it's something that fans may not want to really accept but i mean the, the defense was dropping eight guys and i mean they were they were rushing three so yeah you're gonna have some time and you're probably not gonna have the largest of windows there no right, let's get to the next one here by alan horn uh he says seems to be more traditional running scheme slash packages that dan moen typically puts out there not as much moving the attack points via screens, et cetera. 
Hopefully this is designed to force the offensive line to jail early on where either run game can be a weapon later on. Yeah, we did kind of speak to that as well. And one thing I did notice as well, um, it did seem the run plays where there were more of the quicker handoff types and a running back was able to get north-south pretty quick were more successful than offensive linemen trying to hold their blocks for a, a little while longer uh, and, and tight ends as well, trying to get into the mix. So, uh, but – you could definitely tell that's what they need to work on. I think that's why you saw it a lot. You saw those slow developing run plays a little more just because that is what this offensive line needs to work on. Yeah, we didn't really see like, you know, your traditional like RPOs. We didn't really yeah. see um we saw a lot of uh, Frank's under the center. Yeah. We didn't really see like those those pitches that we saw a lot of last year against some good teams. So I mean it was it just was it just wasn't people people use that term vanilla all the time, but I mean like I don't even know if it was really that because we, it's not as if like we're going to see a whole bunch of like this stuff either against a really good team, I feel like. So, yeah, like we said earlier, it was just one of those deals where you kind of know what you have to work on going into a game and you try to run your offense to kind of get better at those things. And if you could take that out of this week, great, and still win the game 45 nothing. I mean, why not? That's, that's really what you're kind of getting out of this. It's what you're supposed to be doing. All right. Uh, Montrez Mosley uh, says it was exciting. To, it was exciting to see the less experienced guys get significant playing time. It seems we have some very, very talented freshmen. We have to be able to establish the run game moving forward into conference play. Uh, the Gators listed will 15 true freshmen that that played, uh, in, including Buck Mamudi Abate, Kyer Elam, Naquan Wright, Kyan, Keon Zipperer. Deontay Marks, Jadon Hill, Chester Kimbrough, Tyron Hopper, Josiah Pierre, Michael Tarquin, Ethan White, Trent Whittemore, Jamarcus Weston, Chris Bogle, and Buck Lloyd Summerall as well. And all 15 true freshmen got on the field uh, of that list. Diabate, Bogle, Elam Hill uh, all played against Miami as well. And some redshirt freshmen also got into the mix. Emory Jones, Copeland, Clement, McDowell, Garage, Dante Lang, Andrew Chatfield, uh, were part of this game as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's exactly what this game was designed for if you're looking at this at this coaching staff and getting preparation for Kentucky and preparation for SEC play. It, uh, it we, we mentioned it that we saw them early and often, the, those defensive backs. But once the fourth quarter got around, uh, Florida went deep into the depth chart. Good, good re- recruiting pitch, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in Florida. You'll play a little bit. Um you know, I think I think part of that is actually pretty true. I think a guy like Chris Bogle, for example, if he if he plays up to what his upside suggests he's capable of, he's a guy who's probably going to leave early anyway. I mean, that's just a fact. Um, if he plays up to that upside, and and is the guy that people think he can be, so what does that redshirt year really mean for you? Probably nothing. So I could kind of see them internally kind of wanting to do that a little bit more where you could kind of use that to your advantage in recruiting because no big time recruit wants to sit out a year or, or red shirt and play four, four meaningless games against FCS schools or lesser blowout games, or whatever the case is just to get experience. They want to play right away. And so I think that if you could kind of show that you're able to kind of do that in a way that makes sense for the player and the program, like it appears that Florida is doing right now, then yeah, go for it because that's, that's going to help you out a little bit. I feel like, and the other side of that, of course, like we mentioned earlier, they wanted to build a little depth because you just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what you're going to need. You don't know who you're going to depend on. And so to get these guys, so a little bit of game action where nothing becomes their first anymore, then that, that boosts you a little bit. That gives you a good, that gives you some, some good things to work with going forward because you just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know who's going to get hurt or what you're going to need in a couple of weeks and not for nothing, but they also played pretty well. Uh, I thought Bogle played played relatively well, uh, made a couple of nice plays. I think he had a sack or two, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, Diabati looked pretty good. Um, and Diabati was playing on special teams, too. Uh, he was a guy who I thought would carve out a role in special teams just because I know he's pretty pretty smart. And he got he got on campus early as an early enrollee. And he was there on special teams, too, uh, being a factor. So that's good to see. Again, it, it's it, if you're a program like Florida, you want true freshmen to play because that adds to your recruiting pitch and makes you a little bit more desirable. 
Yeah, five tackles, one sack for Bogle there. So, yeah, very good, uh, as you mentioned, uh, to see that. Uh, next tweet comes in to kind of the segue into our final uh, part of this episode. Bull Gator says, with Miami losing to North Carolina, it seems that we do not really know the Gators yet. They have played two bad teams and lost uh, and almost lost to one. So um, there was a lot of talk of, uh, you know, how would Miami rebound after Florida, after the Florida game to go to Chapel Hill and, and lose in North Carolina 28-25. I mean, I don't know what that means for Florida. I don't know if there's any transitive property there. You know, transitive property in sports will get you in trouble sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, you know, especially early on in the, in the season. So, uh, yeah, will it have probably looked better on Florida's resume for, for Miami to, to eat that game out versus North Carolina? Of course. I uh, still don't know if it necessarily translates into what Florida is right now, Will. Yeah, I'm not sure. With college football, everything's pretty subjective because that's just the way it is with, with the rankings, and the rankings matter. Obviously, the, the college football playoff one matters a heck of a lot more than what we're seeing in week two and week three from the AP or the coaches poll. But for right now, that's what we have to go by. And so, yeah, subject, what you, how you are perceived matters – but I think my, I mean, I, I got, I was not able to really watch that game, of course, yeah. in North Carolina. So I don't really, I can't really offer that much of an ins, insightful take on, on where Miami is right now. But just from that week zero game, I, I still like their defense. I thought their defense was pretty good. Um, I don't know, again, what they did against North Carolina. I was not able to really watch that or really see any clips on it either. Just didn't have enough time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's early. Um I'm kind of surprised to see them be 0-2, but hey, maybe maybe North Carolina is a lot better than we thought they were. Yeah, I mean, two win, two wins over one over South Carolina, one over Miami right now. They beat Miami, so I mean, you can look at it so many different ways, and you got nothing's like in a vacuum here. Where yeah. it's, same thing with like Florida and the polls. It's like a couple like last week when they dropped a little bit. It's like, well, yeah, their sloppiness against Miami, if you will, probably cost them a little bit. But also Auburn beat a top twenty-five Oregon team, so yeah. like they're gonna move up. Yeah. That's just the way it is. So it's like you gotta account for everybody when, when you're looking at the the big picture of like where you stand, because that's that's really what matters is where you stand in the context of everybody else, not just on your on your own. Yeah. Uh, so what we'll do here uh, on reaction episodes is look at what the rivals and uh, the SEC did uh, before we get into the SEC. Will FSU. 45, Louisiana Monroe, 44 in a game that went to overtime. Faster, huh? Uh, I even had a receiver line up the opposite direction of the play. I saw that, yeah. Uh, they worked on they, they, um, that play worked, though, didn't it? Uh, I didn't. I, I have no idea. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could be, I could be totally off, but I think. No, yeah, and, uh, and you know what? It probably did just because everybody was lost in what was going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it was. A, 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 it looked good or anything like that. I'm just saying that. <laughs> yeah, but FSU. Oh man, they're, they're tough times in tally when you beat Louisiana Monroe uh, by one point in overtime. Uh, SEC quickly before we get here. Uh, Missouri rebounds with a nice defensive performance over West Virginia, thirty-eight to seven. Uh, South Carolina, Ryan Helinski gets his first start, 72 to 10 over Charleston Southern. Uh, Vanderbilt travels to Purdue, loses 42 to 24. Uh, Mississippi State wins 38 15 over Southern Miss. Uh, one of the big headline games over the weekend Clemson 24, Texas AM 10. That game wasn't really close uh, at all uh, for the most part, especially when you got into the second quarter uh, there. Alabama 62 to 10 over New Mexico State. Georgia 63 17 over Murray State. Well, man, Tennessee, 29-26 losers to BYU. I was trying to keep up with that game a little bit while we were uh, watching Florida. I I really did think Tennessee would be better uh, in Pruitt's second year, just you know, take some kind of step. It's weird. It really looks like they've taken a step backwards. Oh, no doubt. I mean, uh, right now you can't say that they haven't. I mean, they, they they're bad. They're as bad as it gets right now. Um, so for anybody kind of who were the least bit worried that Tennessee would come into Gainesville and, and somehow win that game, uh, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to find too many people who agree with you on the, at this point. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. not pretty at all. So, yeah, I mean, at this, like right now you look at Florida's schedule after the, after the list that you just kind of went down, there's really no reason why they shouldn't be 5-0 and when they head into that game against Auburn on October 5th, I believe. 
Right. Yep. That's uh, when that game is. And part of the reason there is uh, Kentucky's the, the next opponent for the Gators and Terry Wilson starting quarterback for uh, for Kentucky looks to be done for the year. I don't know if they've put out an official word yet, but pretty much what Stoops was saying last night that Terry Wilson uh, will be done for the year. So, uh, you know, Florida would travel to, to, to Kentucky with a quarterback making his first start uh, of the season. Transfer from Troy. I don't remember. His last name Smith, but I don't remember his first name there. Uh, Auburn beats Tulane 24-6. to uh, And then in the big game of the weekend, game of the week, LSU 45-38. Well, I question this LSU offense. Just because you change doesn't necessarily you'll mean you'll be better. I was going to use last night as a pretty good barometer. That offense has changed, and that offense is better. Yeah, I mean LSU is right now the talk of college football, and it's going to be that way until if if and when the tiger the Tigers lose a game, uh, because that offense, like you said, it's different. Uh, it's finally rejoined the rest of college football and in an evolution. So good for them, but they're a tough task, and they're going to be a tough task to beat for Florida next month. And in Baton Rouge, by the way, that's it's a tough game. It was always going to be a tough game, and if you actually look at the ESPN FPI right now, Florida has a better chance at beating Georgia than they do beating LSU on the road in Baton Rouge. Ooh. So that gives you an idea of just what the metrics and what numbers are suggesting about LSU's early play right now. And absolutely. Um, Burrow throws for four touchdowns, 471 yards. That defense did give up 401 yards to Ellinger uh, in the air and 60 yards uh, to, on the ground through, to, to him as well. So uh, maybe some more work to do on the defense for LSU, but that offense definitely uh, looks a lot different. And in the finale for the SEC, Ole Miss wins 31-17 over Arkansas. So we'll – of course, right after games, uh, the, you're really busy at the athletic putting a couple articles up. Uh, I do want to go back to your article last week uh, that everyone needs to go read uh, on the recruiting staff uh, overhaul from, from Dan Mullen. Really good look there from Will, some uh, direct quotes from Dan Mullen about what he saw. You guys know if you listen to Gators Breakdown, I, 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 I talked a lot about the, uh, the – the way that staff needed to be overhauled and the problems that were going on there kind of behind the scenes of the recruiting staff. And Will, man, you uh, really did a good job there of, uh, of clearing the air and, and really presenting uh, what's going on behind the scenes in the recruiting department for the Gators right now. I appreciate that. And I think that Dan Mullen definitely did have a vision of what he wanted his off the field recruiting staff to look like. But when you're hired at a place like Florida and you're kind of forced to make some early hires there, maybe you do make some mistakes. And, and I think the, the biggest thing to do is to really correct them as fast as you can and understand, okay, th these are the areas that it's not working. Here's why. And here's what I need to do to fix it. And I feel like Dan Mullen's done a pretty decent job at, at sort of looking at that, diagnosing the issue and then trying to resolve it. Time will tell. And it's very, very early. Uh, this staff was really just kind of put together over the past few months and I think one of the most recent hires was just a couple of weeks ago. So it's early. So I'm not trying to say that this is the greatest staff of all time or anything like that. I don't know. Um, we don't know what it's going to be like, but it looks vastly improved as just as far as organizational, uh, what the direction is, and really just being on the same page. It looks a lot different than last year. And just from talking with people, it appears to be that way uh, where he's had it designed now um, so that an off the field staffer, we see all those titles where it's like listed as assistant director of player personnel. What in the world does that mean? Well, it kind of means that they're working with an on field staffer as far as mapping out the logistics of recruiting, but also taking on another role as far as whether they're in charge of camps or another guy may be in charge of the transfer portal. So in that story, I kind of ran down the list of sort of who's in charge of what, why that is, who a little bit of background on, on who these people are, why they were good fits and why it ultimately should work or at least be better than what it was last year. Um, but again, I mean, it's one of those things where it's not a cure all. They're still going to have to win games. They're still going to have to uh, follow through with their facility upgrades and they're still going to have to get some good recruiting out of their system still. Uh, but it was one of those things that had to be done and it had to be improved. And so if you're a Florida fan, you should feel a little bit better about that situation, knowing that it was uh, at least diagnosed and recognized and perhaps fixed. All right there. So uh, go read that article for sure. And, and, and Will's recaps of, uh, 
I'm uh, looking back at the UT Martin game uh, as well as later this week preview and uh, the Kentucky game coming up. Uh, Florida will be eight in the coaches poll and nine in the AP poll when they travel to Lexington and take on Kentucky this weekend. Uh, will anything else, man? Man, I'm good. I'll be in. I'll be in Lexington. If uh, people want to follow along with me, um, I'll should be there on Friday Friday uh, afternoon or so. So looking forward to that game. First time in Lexington. Lexington. So. I'm excited about it. Uh, should be a lot better game than we had yesterday. So that's good, right? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you would think. Um, first and we'll, yeah, and we'll get updates, I'm sure, on Monday, tomorrow about Henderson and, and Tony. So. That too. Yeah, of course. Um, so definitely a press conference that people would want to listen to and, and be abreast of what happens in. All right. That's Will Salmon from The Athletic. Go uh, download The Athletic app and uh, subscribe there. Uh, or, or, or search them uh, or theathletic.com, I think. Right, real? Yeah. Yeah, you yep. got it. All right there. So, yeah, good work there. Uh, college football coverage as well uh, from from around the country. That's Will Salmon from The Athletic. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SCC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.